Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. Now, the land of familiar was a lovely place. The weather was always sunny and warm. Everybody had a secure job, a comfortable home, and a safe, predictable future. Every day in the land of ordinary was, or sorry, in the land of familiar was exactly the same as the day before, and nothing ever changed. That was hard for ordinary because he had a dream in his heart, and he knew that dream could never come true in the land of familiar. One day, ordinary realized that his dream had been given to him by God. So he made a decision. He decided that he was going to leave the land of familiar to pursue his big dream. Well, it wasn't anything like what he'd expected. Not only was he attacked by border bullies as he tried to leave the comfort zone, his own family and his very best friends mocked him and criticized him. They told him that he would surely fail, that there is no way that he would ever succeed in reaching his dream. Ordinary came up against one obstacle after another, battling doubt, discouragement, and the constant temptation to quit and go back to the land of familiar. He had to push through the wall of fear. He had to fight through the valley of giants. And he had to endure endless days in the wasteland before he finally reached his land of promise. And there he lived his dream. But when his big dream in the city was almost done, the dream giver appeared to him again. And he said, Ordinary, I have more for you. And he said, Well done, Ordinary. You are a good and faithful dreamer. Now I want to show you more. More, asked Ordinary. More, said the dream giver. There's so much more of my big dream waiting for you. What do you see, Ordinary? Well, Ordinary looked out at the horizon, and he saw many valleys and wide waters, and he saw the gleam of many more lands of promise waiting for a dreamer to claim for the glory of the dream giver. And the dream giver said, Ordinary, soon I want you to leave what is familiar once again and step into the more that I have for you. Well, here we are, ROVC family. It's the very last Sunday of 2019, and we're about to embark on a brand new year. I don't know what 2019 was like for you. For me, there was, you know, good and bad. There was some heartache and disappointment, but there were also some blessings and some victories. But as I stand here, waiting to embark on 2020, I'm ready for more. I'm ready to step into the more that God has for me. What about you? Are you ready to step into more of God's destiny for your life in 2020? How many of you are ready for more? It's a good thing, because the title of my message is Step Into More in 2020. (laughs) If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. If you're using a Bible app with different versions, I'm using the New King James Version this morning. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What is that race that is set before us? Well, it's Father God's unique call and purpose for each one of us. And it's not a place, and it's not a destination. It's not one particular role, or job description, or title. It's a path. And as we choose each day to follow God on that path, as we run our race, He will, he will lead us step by step into more. And each step that we take will also lead us into increasingly greater measures of influence and fruitfulness for the glory of God. It's also a race that we run by faith. As the Bible says, a just shall live by faith. So faith is the fuel that sustains us and propels us each step of the way from the beginning of the race until the end when God calls us home. Let's go back to Hebrews 12, 1 for a moment. 
Therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race. What is therefore referring to? And who are these witnesses? Anyone? Who are the witnesses? Yeah, they're the faith heralds listed in the previous chapter. Hebrews chapter 11 starts by defining faith in the first verse and the second verse. Then the remainder of the chapter tells us what over 17 different men and women did and accomplished as a result of their faith. Let's look at verses 22 to 34 in chapter 11. Time would fail to tell me of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, escaped the sword, quenched the violence of fire, and out of weakness were made strong. They became valiant in battle and they turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Well, so how do we develop that kind of faith? Well, as I'm sure you've discovered, discovered, it's a process, it's a path, it's a journey. And it's a process that will take place for the rest of our lives. Because none of us will have perfected faith until we see Jesus face to face. I've chosen one of the Hebrews chapter 11 faith heroes to be our tour guide this morning on our marathon of faith. And that is Abraham. And why Abraham? In both the Old and the New Testaments, he's called the father of our faith. In the New Testament alone, there are over 70 verses that refer to Abraham, and he's the number one example in the Bible of what it means to grow in faith. I also chose him for another reason. Abraham was a very imperfect man. He wasn't born with any kind of special faith. His family background was not conducive to growing in faith. To the contrary, Abraham's family worshipped idols. He didn't have a Bible or books or mentors or YouTube or Pastor Dave or Pastor Sheldon to teach him about faith and how to grow in the ways of God. Abraham grew into a giant of faith that took place over many years, 30 years in fact. And through those years, he made lots of mistakes. He sinned, he compromised, he succumbed to fear, doubt, and discouragement. And he did that not once, not twice, but periodically throughout his journey of faith. And I don't know about you, but that makes me very happy. Because I have also battled many times of discouragement, doubt, and unbelief. I've also sinned, and I've compromised, and I've succumbed to fear. And in all likelihood, so have most of you at one time or another. But it was through his successes and his failures through times of believing and times of doubt, that Abraham's faith and character matured and developed. And God used all of that, the good and the bad, to prepare him, to prepare his character and his faith so that he could handle the blessings and responsibilities of the ultimate calling that God had for his life. That's what God wants to do in each one of our lives. He wants to prepare each one of us for increasingly greater purpose and influence and destiny for his glory. For the remainder of our time together, I want to cover five strategies for stepping into more through faith in 2020. Are you ready? (laughs) Number one, embrace a vision. Embrace a vision. How many of you here watched Bianca Andresco from Mississauga when the U.S. opened tennis match a few months ago? Yeah, that was awesome. Well, it was an amazing accomplishment. She's only 19 years old, and she beat Serena Williams, who's not only much older and much more experienced, but Serena had already won the title nine different times, and everybody thought that she would win. After winning the match, Bianca said this in a TV interview. This is very special to me, but I have very big dreams, and I don't want to settle for anything less than what I want. I want to become number one in the world. Like my mom always says to me, don't forget who you are and dream big to get big. Well, I doubt that any one of us here are dreaming to become number one in the world. That's not our motivation as followers of Christ. But we do need a dream. We do need a vision. Do you have a dream? Do you have a dream that is way bigger than you? 
a dream that you could not make happen, a dream that would require the, the power and the grace and the anointing of God to come to pass? Vision is an incredible motivator. For someone with a dream to run at the Olympics, the vision might be to win a gold medal. For Abraham, who started out named Abram, it was an incredible promise from the God of the universe when God himself said to him, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless, who, bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What is the dream that God has placed in your heart? What promises has Father God given you? I want you to think about that for a moment. Is there something new that God has been stirring in your spirit and your heart? Or perhaps is there something that he's reminding you about? A dream that you've forgotten or given up on because of difficulties and delays and disappointments along the way? If you don't have a dream from God, perhaps a good question to ask yourself is this. Am I listening? Am I asking? Am I spending daily solitary time in his presence, in prayer, and in his word and worship? Or am I running so fast, doing and doing and doing more, that I'm too tired and driven and busy to sit at his feet and listen? In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, Paul prayed that believers would receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? Well, he answers that question in the next verse, next two verses. And I like the message paraphrase of these. It says, to make you intelligent and discerning and knowing him personally, your eyes focused and clear, so you can see exactly what he's calling you to do. To step into more in 2020, we need to be listening to the Holy Spirit. And then we need to embrace the vision that he has for us. Strategy number two, make friends with discomfort. Anyone with a dream to run in the World Olympics knows there will be a price. They know that they will have to leave many comforts behind that most of us take for granted. During the last Olympics, a journalist interviewed a number of athletes for a news story about what was involved in their training and preparation. In his article, he reported that they had worked out an average of six hours a day, six days a week, 51 weeks a year. Whoa. <laughs> Those athletes accepted that discomfort would be part of the price for pursuing their life dream. Well, Abraham also had to leave behind many comforts. Before giving him the promise that he would father a nation, God told him that there was a condition, a prerequisite. And we see it in Genesis 12, verse 1, where God said, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. What do you think that was like for Abraham and Sarai? Before working on this message, I never gave much thought to the sacrifices that they may have had to make to step into their destiny. I imagined them living in a grass hut or a cave or something like that. I, I had no idea what it was like for them. The Bible actually doesn't give us any details. Abraham and Sarai lived in the city of Ur in southern Mesopotamia, which is now modern-day Iraq. Now, Ur was no poverty-stricken little outpost in the middle of nowhere. It was actually a very large and opulent city that drew its vast wealth from its position on the Persian Gulf, which gave it proximity to trade. The land was also very fertile, and Mesopotamia was so rich in agricultural products that the crops provided way more than they needed to support the population. So that allowed them to trade the surplus for other goods. And the city of Ur itself was situated right next to the Persian Gulf. So what were the homes like in Ur? Archaeological excavations have revealed that most homes in ancient Ur were actually very large and comfortable. They were made of baked mud brick, most were two or three stories high, and some had more than a dozen or so rooms. Bigger than my house. On the main floor of a typical home, there was an open central courtyard with a fountain that was surrounded by various domestic rooms. And those included a kitchen 
usually equipped with a beehive-shaped bread oven and a cooking range, workrooms, a family room, a domestic chapel where the cult structures and family burial vault was kept, a reception area for guests, and a lavatory. Now, the lavatory didn't have a jacuzzi tub and granite tiles, but it was a lavatory nonetheless. It consisted of a paved floor with a hole in the middle that drained. Some of the larger homes also had a full guest suite on the main floor with its own set of rooms and a lavatory. Okay, so that gives you a better idea of what God was asking Abraham and Sarai to leave behind. That couldn't have been easy for them. And I can't help but think that it must have been especially hard for Sarai. She, if she's like most of us women, she would have treasured her home. Home was her place of refuge, the place where she fellowshiped with her friends and family. And I can see her thinking, I'm supposed to leave all this? My beautiful home that I just redecorated? My family? My relatives? Can we take any of the furniture? What about the family photo albums? Will there be internet there? Can I take my iPad and my cell phone? Maybe she began to think, I wonder, did old Abe really hear from God? I mean, after all, he is kind of getting on in years. Maybe he's getting a little senile and hearing voices. Why would God want us to start all over again at our age? Where will we go? What will we do? How will we get there? Now remember, at this point in time, God did not say anything whatsoever about what the land would be like, what the journey would be like, how they would get there, or what they're supposed to do when they arrived. All Abraham received was one very general promise and one instruction. So in a nutshell, God said, leave, go somewhere, and I'll bless you. Hebrews 11.8 says that by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By the way, Abraham, Abraham was about 70 years old when God first called him in Ur. Instead of fully obeying the call right away, Abraham partially obeyed. They started out on the journey, but then they stopped in Tehran and lived with Abraham's father for a few years before they finally left for Canaan when he was about 75. Is Father God prompting you to take a step of faith? A step that requires stepping out of your comfort zone? Maybe a step into something that you can't see very clearly at this point? Maybe a step that will require that you face a fear? Does it involve taking a risk? Does it feel scary, challenging, intimidating? How badly do you want to step into more of God's destiny in 2020? Do you want it badly enough to sacrifice some comfort? What comfort is God asking you to leave behind? Strategy number one, embrace a vision. Number two, make friends with discomfort. And three, push through the wall. The wall. Anyone who does long-distance running is familiar with the term. It's not a literal, literal wall, of course. It's a sensation that long-distance runners get in the last half of a long-distance race, when they physically or mentally feel that they can't go any further. It's caused by a depletion of glycogen stores in the liver and muscles, and it causes sudden, overwhelming fatigue and the loss of energy and motivation. Some runners describe it as feeling like they're running through mud or they're running with bags of sand on their feet. Have you ever felt like that on the path to your dream? I have. Times when you feel like you've been doing everything that God has shown you to do, but you've come up against a major barrier and you feel like you're running through mud? Abraham also hit a few different walls on his journey of faith. One he encountered time and again was the wall of doubt. Now, the first time this is described in Genesis occurred a few years after they'd been living in Canaan. God obviously knew that Abraham was struggling, and in his goodness, he appeared to Abraham in a vision to remind him of the promise. And we see it in Genesis 15:1 when he said, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. 
Well, how did Abraham respond? Well, he responded in much the same way that we sometimes respond when we're feeling overwhelmed by thoughts and feelings of discouragement and doubt. He pointed out the bleakness of his circumstances, as if God didn't already know, and he also made a point of telling God that he wasn't doing one thing to help him out. Verse 2. Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house in Eliezer is Eliezer of Damascus? Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house will be my heir. I want you to notice something about God's response to Abraham. He didn't chastise him or belittle him. He didn't smack him on the head and tell him to grow up and smarten up and be a man. No, God encouraged Abraham. Verse 4, God said, This one shall not be your heir, but one who comes from your own body shall be your heir. Then God encouraged him some more by taking him outside and saying, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. And I wonder how Abraham felt as he gazed at those stars. I know that when I look at the stars or I go hiking in the mountains or watch 20-foot waves crash against a rocky seashore, I am always encouraged with fresh awe and amazement and wonder at the majesty and the glory and the greatness and the power of my God. And I'm sure it's the same for most of you. We know Abraham was encouraged because the very next verse says, Abraham believed the Lord and God accounted it to him for righteousness. If you're facing a wall of fear, doubt, or discouragement, you need to know this. God is not mad at you. He doesn't want you to stay there, of course, but he will meet you right where you're at. He's always ready and willing to give us the encouragement that we need. So how do you push through the wall? Well, there are a number of ways, but I'm just going to briefly mention a few that are quite helpful. Number one, keep declaring and praying and standing on the Word of God. As Ephesians 6 says, the word of God is a sword of the spirit, a very powerful weapon for spiritual warfare. Praise and thank God for who he is. You know, sometimes our circumstances look very bleak, but we can always be praising God for his many wonderful attributes. Sometimes when I'm feeling discouraged or tired or just drained, I go through the alphabet and I match it up to God's attributes. You know, like, God, I praise you for you are almighty God. Lord, you are beautiful beyond description. Lord, you are God of compassion. Lord, you are my deliverer. Lord, you are everlasting. You are my father, the father of lights, in whom there's no shadow nor variables of turning. And I just go right through the alphabet, right to Z. And I feel wonderful afterwards. So praise and thank God for who he is. Build community and ask others for prayer. We all need community to run the race that God has set before us. We can't do this on our own. We can't run this race on our own, and God never meant us to. He designed us in such a way that uh, purpose and relationships are intricately, intricately, and inextricably intertwined. <laughs> I think I knew. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> So build community, strengthen your friendships. Uh, Connect groups are a really great way to do that. I go to the push group on Wednesday nights, and I can think of many times when, uh, um, you know, it's just I'm feeling tired, and the last thing I want to do is go out in the evening, especially when it's snowing like crazy and minus 30. But when I go, I always come back encouraged and built up and refreshed and strengthened in my faith. So we need community. And another very powerful way to press through the wall, especially if if, if it's something that you've been facing for a long time, is to spend extra time alone in God's presence. Now, I'm not talking about your daily devotions, as important as that is. I'm talking about doing whatever you need to do to refresh your faith. It might be a half day, a whole day, two days, three days, when you just separate yourself from your work and from the stresses of everyday life, and from all your digital devices, and you just spend time in his presence, reading his word, reading inspiring books, praying his word, receiving from him, worshiping him. Do whatever you need to do until you're encouraged and strengthened in your faith. 
Then pick yourself up, get back in the race, and you will press through the wall. Strategy number four, don't settle for less. Hebrews 6, verses 11 and 12 says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Throughout Scripture, patience and faith are linked. I wish it wasn't so, but it is. You know, we all go through seasons when it's easier to believe God. You know, we're praying, we're believing for victory, we're trusting Him, and everything is wonderful. But there's this thing called T-I-M-E, time. Months pass, years pass, and you're still not seeing a major breakthrough. Deep down, you might start questioning God's willingness or power to intervene in your circumstances. At times like that, we can be tempted to settle for less. We're tempted to settle for what we can accomplish through human effort. And that's exactly what happened to Abraham. We just looked at how he experienced a major breakthrough over doubt and unbelief. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And so he did, for a season. But the years continued to pass, and there was still no child. By this time, Abraham was 85 years old, and Sarai was 75. I wonder if Abraham was beginning to think, well, God said I would father a nation, but he didn't say anything about Sarai. Does it have to be through Sarai? After all, she's been barren her entire life, not to mention the fact that she's 75. What woman would even want to bear a child at 75? And I can see Abraham saying to Sarai, honey, maybe we misunderstood God. You know, we've been waiting a long time. Maybe he wants us to do something about it. You know what they say, God helps those who help themselves. Whatever they said to each other, we do know that Sarai came up with a plan that Abraham thought was a wonderful idea, but Galatians 4.23 describes as according to the flesh. It was a simple plan, and it made perfect sense. Abraham would sleep with Sarai's maid, Hagar, in the hopes of conceiving a child. Well, the plan worked, and a year later, Hagar gave birth to a son, whom Abraham named Ishmael. So it was a smashing success. So the plan must have been from God, right? Wrong. (laughs) Ishmael was never the son of God's promise. He was a son of the flesh, the result of human effort and unbelief. And although God blessed uh, Ishmael for the sake of Abraham, as well as Hagar the maid, who was an innocent victim in all this, there were consequences, and we're still seeing those consequences played out today. The sons and daughters of Abraham and the sons and daughters of Ishmael have been fighting each other ever since. And if you follow world news, you know that tensions and and, uh, fighting in the Middle East has been escalating and has been for some time, especially between Iran and Israel, and that will continue until Jesus returns. The bottom line, it's never a good idea to birth an Ishmael. With that said, most of us have, at one time or another, settled for less. Times when we trust more in our own abilities, strengths, intellect, and resources than in God. Sometimes we pay the price with anxiety and burnout. Sometimes we pay the price by settling for a reduced version of God's will and vision that we made happen partly with God, but mostly on our own. It might have been a small thing. It might have been a life-altering decision. What's important now is that we remain aware of our human tendency to get impatient and run ahead of God and try to make things happen on our own. And whenever we realize that we're doing that, to repent, receive forgiveness, and get back in the race. So strategies for stepping into more in 2020. Number one, embrace a vision. Number two, make friends with discomfort. Three, push through the wall. Four, don't settle for less. And finally, never, 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 never give up. Never give up. 
Every one of you here who is truly committed to fulfilling God's call on your life will experience disappointment, pain, and setbacks as you run your race. There will be times when the journey feels too hard, too demanding, too discouraging. We already saw how Abraham struggled with that. There have been times when I felt like that, and I'm sure it's the same for most of you here. Just a couple of years ago, I felt so very tempted to drop out of the race and move to Hawaii for the rest of my life. <laughs> and Brian, he's all in favor of that. <laughs> for many years, it seemed like there's just one thing after another, one adversity after another. It started with an illness that took everything out of me uh, for many years until I finally let go of my spiritual pride and accepted medical treatment. Then there was a tragic death of my beautiful sister at Christmas about 10 years ago. That really rocked my world. I loved Diane so very much. The following year, my parents' health deteriorated to the point where they needed a lot of care. So I was working part-time, and the rest of my time and energy was spent caring for them, which I don't regret. I love them very much, and it was a privilege and an honor to be able to serve them in that way. But it was hard not being able to do any writing, which was my passion. The year after Diane's death, my book, Making Your Dreams Your Destiny, had won two national awards, and I was full of dreams and plans and ideas for more books. But there was never any time. But in the spring of 2014, it looked like all that would change. It looked like I would finally have some time to do some writing. A wonderful caregiver that I'd been working on getting to Canada from the Philippines finally arrived, and she was a gift from God, a Christian. She genuinely, genuinely loved mom and dad, and, and I completely trusted her with them. And although I still spent a couple of hours a day with them, this was a brand new season when I was going to be able to begin writing again. So there I was on the afternoon of April 14th, 2014, sitting in front of my computer, and I was so happy. I had the whole afternoon to write. For the first time in so long, I could spend some focused time writing. So I wrote the first chapter of a new book, as well as some notes and thoughts for other chapters. Well, later that day, I went to an exercise class. And as I was driving home, thanking God for what a wonderful day to be able to write, um, as I was driving home, I saw a truck speeding towards me from the opposite direction. Then it looked like it flew towards me across the median that separated our lanes, and that's all I remember. When I finally woke up, I was in the most excruciating pain that I could ever imagine. The truck had hit me head on, and there was practically nothing left of my small car. So when Brian got there, because they called him to the, to the accident, he didn't think there was any way that I could possibly have survived. Well, it turned out I had a major burst fracture in my spine, numerous soft tissue injuries, and a severe concussion. But it was a miracle that I was alive. But that ended my writing again for a very long time. For several months, I couldn't walk more than a dozen or so steps without my motorized wheelchair. But what bothered me most of all, more than the pain and the sleepless nights, was the brain in injury, the inability to focus, to process or retain information, to write. So I thought, well, I'll recover soon, in weeks. That's what concussions usually do, don't they? But the months went by, years went by, and the symptoms didn't improve. Approximately two years ago, I went away for a three-day personal spiritual retreat at Canmore to rest and to pray. There I was that first morning, feeling brain dead, exhausted, with excruciating headaches, emotionally, mentally, and physically drained, and so very discouraged. I was having myself a great little pity party. I had a whole pot of coffee. I was sitting there and just feeling really sorry for myself. And then I said, Lord, is this ever going to end? Is the pain ever going to stop? Is my brain ever going to heal? Will I ever be able to write again? I'm just so tired of this. Well, what I wanted God to say to me was this. Oh, you poor thing. Um, you know, you are getting a little older, Judy. You know, maybe, maybe you and Brian, you can just move to Hawaii and retire and just enjoy life for the rest of your life. He didn't say that. Instead, he said, are you going to let the enemy 
steal your call? Are you going to let him steal the gifts that I have placed in you? I am a restorer of the years that the enemy has stolen. So shake off your disappointment, shake off your self-pity, shake off your doubts. What I've said I will do, I will do. Well, the symptoms didn't go away right away, but I was no longer discouraged, and God had renewed my faith. A few weeks after that, I had an appointment with my brain specialist, who told me that after all this time, there was not likely to be any improvement ever. He was wrong. It's not his word that matters, it's God's word. Amen? And about one year ago, I started to experience sudden and dramatic changes in my brain. It seemed to happen almost overnight. I could focus, and I could process information almost as well as before the accident. I could even write for a whole hour without getting headaches and dizziness. What a gift! And it keeps getting better and better. And I know that God will finish this, because that's who He is. What He started, He will complete. What he started through me, he will complete. And I'm so thankful for the goodness and the faithfulness of our Lord. You know, sometimes it takes a lot longer to experience the fulfillment of God's promises than we expect. Sometimes it looks and feels like nothing is happening. But God is faithful, and what he's promised to do, he will do. He's not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should repent. What God has said he will do, what he's promised he will bring to pass. No matter what we face, if we will let him, God will use those difficult times, the disappointment, and the struggles to mold us more into his image and prepare us for greater purpose. Adversity will make you bitter or better. It's your choice. And that's what God did for Abraham. Abraham's final temptation to give up on the promise happened when he's 99 years old and Ishmael was about 15 years old. Now at that point, God appeared to him to remind him of the covenant promise. We see that in Genesis chapter 17, starting in verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be called Abraham which means father of nations. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and kings shall come from you, and I will make nations of you. Then scroll down to verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Well, it appears that Abraham was still not fully convinced. Look how he responded. Verse 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and he said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Then Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael may live before you. He was still trying to sell God on the idea of Ishmael being the promised son. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Then God said that Sarah would bear a child in one year's time, and that's exactly what happened. Abraham was 100 years old, and Sarah was 90 when they finally experienced the fulfillment of God's promise, 30 long years after God first called them in Ur. And through all those years of waiting, through the ups and downs, the successes and failures, the doubt and unbelief, Abraham's faith continued to grow. And years later, we can see just how much his faith had matured and how much his character had grown when God asked him to sacrifice that precious son, the son whom he'd waited for his entire life, the son whom he loved more than life itself. Abraham's obedience was instant, his trust unquestioning. 
And of course, we know the end of the story. At the very last moment, as Abraham took up his knife to slay his son, the Lord appeared and stopped Abraham from sacrificing his son and said, Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So what are we seeing here? Abraham's character had matured to the point that God couldn't trust him with anything. His heart was 100% yielded to his Lord. Israel is the only nation in human history that was ever created by a sovereign act of God. And Abraham could handle the incredible calling to father this chosen nation that was destined to be a blessing to the world because his heart was 100% yielded to his Lord. And that is what mature faith looks like. Now, I know as you've already discovered, we go through a lot of tests on our journey of faith. Tests that is designed to grow us and mold us more into the image of Christ. And for the same reason that Abraham went through all those tests. So that we also will develop the faith and the maturity of character to responsibly steward greater measures of anointing and influence. So keep going. Don't give up. You will inherit the promises God has given you if you don't give up, if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And as you choose to walk one step at a time and run with endurance the race that God has set before you, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. So will you give your all to run with endurance the race that God has set before you? Will I? Will we keep going no matter what and persevere to win the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? Will all of us as a family, as the RLVC family, as we stand on the threshold of 2020, determine right now that no matter what lies ahead, together, arm in arm, hand in hand, we will continue following God more this year and next year and every year until God calls us home. Would you please stand with me? Oh, Father God, we thank you that you are a good, good Father. No matter what we've been through, no matter what we'll go through in the years ahead, Father, you are a good Father, and you are faithful and true, and all of your promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And Father, we thank you that we can trust, Lord, that what you started in us, you will complete. What you started through us, you will complete. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And Lord, we lift you up and give you all the glory. And Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, which is above every name that is named in heaven and on earth, Lord, in Jesus' name, I take authority over fear and doubt. In Jesus' name, I take authority over unbelief. I take authority over the lies of the enemy. In Jesus' name, and I command those lies to bow before the truth of Almighty God. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's forever settled in the heavens. In fact, Lord, you said that you've exalted your word even above your name. Lord, you are the word made truth. Jesus, you're the word made truth. You're the word made flesh. And so, Father, we exalt you. We exalt your word. We, we lift before you the promises that you've given us. We lift you before you the words you've given us, the prophecies, the dreams, Lord, that you've placed in our heart. And we surrender them to you, God. And we say, Lord, forgive us for all the times that we've doubted. Forgive us for all the times, Lord, that we just have felt like giving up. And Father, right now, we just surrender before you. We surrender before you the gifts that you've placed in our hearts. We surrender before you the time that you've given us, the resources, God. And Father, we make a commitment today that we will steward the call and the gifts that you have placed in us. And Father God, we trust you because, Lord, we know that you are not a man that you should lie. Lord, what you promised you will do and what you said you will do will come to pass. And so, Lord, we just lift up our hearts in trust and faith and confidence, Lord, that you are God, you are King, Lord, and you will be exalted in and through our lives. Amen. <laughs>